Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Um, welcome to our 10th module of uh, the Pele course, uh, The Way of the Psychonaut. Uh, today we'll uh, focus on the problem of spiritual experiences in psychedelic sessions and uh, also uh, other types of holotropic experiences. And uh, we will also explore the relationship between spirituality and uh, religion. So I start by going back to the early years of LSD research when uh, we experienced tremendous surprise. A number of the people who uh, volunteered in LSD sessions uh, reported that they had powerful uh, spiritual experiences, mystical experiences that were very similar to what's described in uh, the great uh, religions in their scriptures. So for example, the three uh, famous pioneers, uh, Timothy Leary and uh, uh, Richard uh, Alpert, who was later called Ramdas, uh, together with uh, Ralph Metzner, um, entitled their first book about LSD, The Psychedelic Experience, a manual used, uh, based on uh, the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Now, later it turned out that these spiritual experiences don't have to uh, take the form of what we see in Bardo Tredoil in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, but um, it can be uh, similar to passages of um, scripts of many other religions. So sometimes it looked like something from the Vedas or Upanishads. Sometimes it uh, looks like something that might uh, appear in uh, the mystical uh, tradition of, of Islam. We have also seen uh, uh, experiences that uh, seem to be bringing ele elements from some of the uh, native uh, traditions, African, uh, Australian, and so on. Um, but there was the problem, you know, there was a group of uh, substances, uh, you know, LSD being one of them, uh, that could induce mystical spiritual experiences or something that looked like mystical experiences. So this started a very heated uh, discussion, uh, debate about uh, what, what was called instant or chemical mysticism, about the nature of these experiences. And uh, very soon we had four different perspectives on this issue that emerged. Uh, the first one was the perspective of hardcore scientists. Uh, their their uh, attitude to this was that this is the end of mysticism. What the mystics thought were very uh, profound insights into the nature of the universe and you know, their, their own real nature were nothing else but uh, aberrations of uh, brain chemistry. And so according to them, this whole area didn't really belong to uh, the realm of religion and spirituality, but should be handled by scientists, by psychopharmacologists, uh, biologists, and so on. Uh, but there was an, another very distinct perspective. Uh, many people who saw it differently, uh, they said, no, there is a, a group of chemicals that uh, can induce mystical experience. It shows the, the numinous dimension of reality. And uh, this makes them very special. We, we would call them uh, sacraments. We would call them uh, sacred medicines. So they basically took uh, the perspective of the shamans of uh, native cultures who were using uh, in their ritual, spiritual life, uh, psychedelic uh, plants. And of course, you know, for uh, these shamans of these cultures, it would not make any sense if we question whether these experiences are uh, genuine because uh, they were uh, inspired or evoked by chemicals from certain plants. For them, the, the plants were um, some, uh, you know, means to, to enter the sacred uh, dimension of reality, the numinous uh, dimension, or they were deities themselves. So this is uh, shown in the names that they gave uh, these substances. For example, 
in the Aztec Nahuatl uh, language. You know, we have Teonanacatl, the, the name for the, for the magic mushrooms. And that means uh, um, flesh of the, of the gods. Now then we had the, the third perspective, uh, which uh, actually was based on uh, uh, the observations and conclusions from uh, Walter Pankey's famous uh, um, experiment called Good Friday Experiment that uh, I've already mentioned a couple of times in previous modules, when in 1964 he gave uh, psilocybin, a substance similar to, uh, to uh, LSD, the, the active alkaloid from uh, the magic mushrooms of the, of the Mazatex, gave it to a group of theological students uh, when half of them had a placebo and he uh, concluded from this experiment that there was no phenomenological difference between uh, what these uh, students experienced and what we find in uh, the spiritual literature of the world. But in this third perspective, these experiences looked like uh, mystical experiences. They were phenomenologically very similar, but uh, they were not genuine. They were pseudo-mystical. To, to have a you know, really real mystical experience, this has to happen as a result of uh, meditation, uh, prayers, fasting, uh, you know, uh, spiritual uh, life, spiritual practice, and so on or it had to come as a, as a grace. So the main representative of this was uh, Meher Baba, uh, you know, famous uh, spiritual teacher, self-proclaimed avatar, you know, God uh, incarnate, uh, who wrote a book, God in the Pill, or God in a Pill, uh, where he expressed very strong opinion there's no way that we can uh, get in touch with God uh, if uh, we use, you know, some, some chemicals for that. And he uh, actually felt that this was a detraction, that this was something that takes us uh, away, that, that is delusional. Um, and uh, put it even stronger, that if uh, God could be um, somehow evoked by chemicals, he would deserve to be God. Uh, there was some support for this perspective that came from uh, Robert Zena, who is a um, comparative uh, scholar, from uh, comparative religionist from England, uh, who wrote a couple of books about this. One was called uh, Mysticism, Sacred and Profane. And then the other one was called uh, Zen Drugs and uh, mysticism. And again, he was coming from a, from a Christian perspective, a uh, very strong opinion that these cannot be genuine experiences, and he actually considered it uh, sacrilegious if people uh, were trying to do it with chemicals or believed that it can be done with chemicals. Now we had also, you know, other perspectives uh, which were, which were uh, opposite of this uh, negation. And uh, those were experiences, as I mentioned, of all the shamans uh, in different uh, parts of the um, world that were using uh, chemicals in the form of psychedelic plants. So this were the Siberian shamans who were using uh, Amanita muscaria. They were the Mexican shamans who were using peyote and uh, magic mushrooms and uh, uh, Oloyuki, which was uh, which were um, morning glory seeds, and also the extract from uh, a secretion of the toad, Pufo uh, alvarius. There were African shamans who were using uh, eboga. There were South American shamans using using ayahuasca and so on. So for them, you know, this was no question that these were genuine experiences. Uh, I also had the privilege of uh, being present in uh, psychedelic sessions of several, several uh, Tibetans, and they all had the sense that this was a very powerful um, uh, accelerator of karma, something that can be very useful 
in spiritual practice, but they were warning, as, as we are, that this is a very powerful method and this could be done very, very carefully with a lot of, uh, lot of guidance, a lot of uh, supervision. Um, I also said personally uh, in a psychedelic session, LSD session, of a Buddhist scholar, Solon Wang, I can mention his name because he wrote a book about this, uh, or included the description of this uh, experience in his book, uh, uh, which was called The uh, the Planes of Cosmos and Life, Multiple Planes of Cosmos and uh, Life. Uh, he's somebody who was brought by his daughter all the way from uh, Taiwan. He was uh, part of the inner circle of uh, Chiang Kai-shek. He was a Buddhist scholar who was practicing Buddhist meditation in a very rigorous way all his life and never has been able to uh, experience uh, Nirvana. And so he came uh, after he read, uh, had read my um, paper, which was on the similarity between psychedelic experiences and um, Indian religions. And uh, he said that, uh, you know, he was um, at the end of his life, he was 70 years old, and that he wanted to experience Nirvana before he died. So he was admitted into this uh, program and I sat for him and he had experience that he considered to be authentic experience of uh, Nirvana. Actually, as he was coming down from the session, he kept offering me $10,000 if I give him another dose on the day, which I, of course, uh, couldn't do. I would have been violating uh, uh, the protocol. Uh, now we have the fourth perspective, which was expressed by Houston Smith, you know, world famous uh, uh, scholar of religion, uh, the um, author of a, of a classic uh, about the religions uh, of the world, who actually himself had uh, psychedelic experiences, including uh, one in our program at, in Maryland. And he was also an observer and, uh, and um, uh, supervisor in uh, uh, Walter Pankey's Good Friday experiment. So unlike Mayor Baba or Zina, he had actually a personal experience. Uh, Mehar Baba was just uh, expressing an opinion that it cannot be done with chemicals, but he was not judging his own, his own experience. Now, uh, as we would expect from Houston Smith, Houston had a very wise uh, uh, perspective that, you know, we showed in the Good Friday experiment that these experiences are phenomenologically indistinguishable from those that you find in uh, religious uh, scriptures, but the value that these experiences would have for uh, the person who experiences them would very, very profoundly depend on the set and setting. So if uh, somebody who is a spiritual seeker, who is involved in uh, rigorous meditation, there's, there's a lot of reading of, of uh, spiritual literature, um, would make, you know, tremendous use of, of this experience would really uh, accelerate and deepen their practice. And this would be very different from somebody who would uh, come to a party in, uh, in uh, Berkeley where they would be serving a fruit punch in a bowl and a jester would come with a handful of uh, uh, sugar cubes laced with LSD, throw it in, people would think they're drinking a punch and they would get a big dose of uh, LSD. And, you know, even under these lousy circumstances, the bad set and setting, they could manage to have a mystical experience. But this would be totally out of uh, context. This could be very confusing and they probably would do very little uh, with it in their, in their everyday life. So those are the, the four perspectives on uh, the value of uh, these mystical experiences. Now we can now uh, look at uh, 
two worldviews. One worldview that was uh, developed by uh, monistic materialistic science uh, in the industrial civilization, and the other, uh, the kind of a worldview that we find in uh, ancient uh, cultures, so that we can in native pre-industrial cultures. And we see a major, major difference. Uh, obviously, you know, Western uh, scientists uh, amassed enormous amount of information about the material world, both the macrocosmos and the microcosmos. Um, uh, but that would be something that uh, would be expected after, you know, it, hundreds of years, and particularly the last 300 years in the Industrial Revolution, uh, the focused uh, attention on uh, the material world, also uh, with the help of uh, Gutenberg's uh, print. So uh, they could have uh, published their results and make it available for future generations. So we get a gradual accumulation of information. So we know about the um, material aspects of the world more than any any of the previous cultures, ancient or or native. So uh, the difference really is not uh, surprising in relation to the knowledge of the of the material world, uh, but there is a difference that really is surprising, and that's a difference in relation to uh, the existence or non-existence of the spiritual dimension of uh, the cosmos. Uh, now, in uh, native cultures, uh, there was, uh, and also uh, ancient cultures, uh, there was a belief that what we experience in everyday life is not the, the whole reality, that there are uh, very important, uh, normally invisible dimensions or dimensions not uh, available to our sensory, sensory uh, perception. And yet, you know, are extremely important for understanding of who we are and uh, understanding of the nature of reality. They had uh, mythologies which uh, included these uh, in normally indivis uh, indivis invisible uh, dimensions. And uh, they were inhabited by archetypal beings, by deities, by demonic uh, presences, by spirits, discarnate uh, entities, uh, power. Uh, power animals, animal uh, spirits, and uh, there were also abodes of the beyond, like uh, different uh, hells, different uh, paradises, uh, um, heavens, uh, purgatories, and so on. Uh, now, for Western scientists, uh, these kinds of statements uh, belong to either books of mythology or uh, handbooks of uh, psychiatry. It's a very, very negative attitude towards anything spiritual. Uh, the universe is a material system. Matter is the only thing that really exists. Uh, the history of the universe is history of developing matter and uh, life, uh, consciousness, uh, intelligence, those are latecomers, you know, like flukes in this, uh, um, you know, tiny, tiny part of a universe that has uh, uh, billions of uh, galaxies. So in this kind of uh, perspective, there's no place for spirituality. It's spirit, you know, the, what do you mean by spirit? Uh, so this is something that reflects uh, ignorance, lack of uh, education, lack of knowledge of, the, of what the material science discovered about the, the world. And uh, it's uh, this magical thinking, it's uh, superstition and so on. And uh, if it takes the form of a direct uh, spiritual experience, then it will be diagnosed as uh, psychotic. So very, very distinct differences between uh, the, this um, attitude to the spiritual dimension of uh, reality. Now, anthropologists who did field work in native cultures were baffled by something that they called double logic. And now they saw that these uh, native cultures had enormous skills, survival skills. They could survive in uh, environments where we would not have chance, Europeans or, or uh, 
Americans, you know, like in the in the middle of Australia, or uh, in the Arctic, and so on. They had great uh, uh, capacity to create tools, implements, uh, you know, for for hunting, for for fishing. Uh, they went fishing. They had nets. They had boats. They had uh, harpoons, uh, uh, fish hooks, and also the the uh, skills of fishing. So uh, the anthropologists were very appreciative about these uh, capacities of native people. But then uh, they watched them, and before they go hunting or fishing, they would sit in a circle, and they would be drumming and rattling and, uh, and chanting. Uh, and uh, to Western-trained anthropologists, it uh, appeared, you know, bizarre irrational, what, what were they doing? Uh, now, when uh, these anthropologists uh, came to study a, a native culture, they were trained how to do it. They have to make, uh, remain uh, objective observers. So when uh, the natives were doing a, a ritual, they would stay outside and they would uh, observe the situation and use certain methods that they were taught to use. For example, there's something called uh, kinesics, when you observe the facial expressions of the, of the native people, or their body movements, or there is something called proxemics, when the anthropologists study what uh, distances from each other do the natives maintain, what, which distances do they feel uh, comfortable. Now, there was a group of uh, anthropologists that had a very different attitude to the field work. They called themselves visionary anthropologists. They were people like uh, uh, Michael Harner, Barbara Meyerhoff, uh, Richard uh, Katz, uh, Peter First, uh, or um, uh, Christian Retsch. So these kinds of anthropologists uh, had a different attitude. When the natives conducted a ritual, uh, they would do it with them, whether it involved all night uh, dancing and uh, fasting, you know, as it would be in the Kalahari Bushmen, or whether they ingested something like the um, um, ayahuasca, uh, you know, the cultures, uh, cultures using ayahuasca or the Mazatec, uh, Mazatec Indians who use the sacred mushrooms. Um, they actually uh, had the direct experience uh, the, with the kind that the natives are having. In uh, anthropology, they distinguish uh, an attitude which is called uh, etic and another one which is called emic. Uh, this, is, this comes from uh, the term phonetics or phonemics. So it's written as a as a um, uh, hyphen and emic or hyphen and etic. Etic was the approach of, uh, or the understanding of the situation that comes from a, an educated, sophisticated uh, uh, anthropologist. And uh, the emic attitude uh, was the explanation of the native themselves. Um, the traditional, uh, Anthropologists had difficulties to understand the emic perspective. Now, the visionary anthropologists had no problems with it because they understood uh, that what the what the uh, natives uh, are doing in their everyday life, as making uh, uh, weapons or fishing implements or or practicing uh, hunting or fishing skills, this is. Um, uh, this is a reflection of their attitude to the material world. What they uh, do in their rituals, uh, uh, out of which the emic system uh, comes, that involves holotropic states of consciousness. And these visionary anthropologists, uh, you know, were very comfortable, and they could assume both of those uh, perspectives, quite quite different from those that that uh, did not have the the um, experience in whatever form of the uh, holotropic state these natives were, uh, were using. Uh, so the difference between these two uh, uh, worldviews is usually interpreted as um, 
superiority of uh, Western science, materialistic science, over uh, superstitions and, and uh, you know, really uh, magical, uh, magic type of uh, thinking. Now, from the perspective that I just described, uh, this difference between those worldviews reflects uh, actually ignorance of the Western industrial civilization in relation to holotropic states. Unlike the native cultures that paid enormous attention to uh, the technologies that can induce uh, uh, holotropic states, they spent a lot of time developing safe and uh, effective ways of, of entering the holotropic states because that was a major vehicle of their ritual, spiritual life. And they also use this for a variety of other uh, reasons, like uh, uh, inspiration for their art or cultivation of uh, intuition and uh, ESP phenomena, or even for practical things, uh, like um, uh, finding lost objects, lost, lost persons, uh, following the, the movement of the game. I think I already mentioned it uh, in one of the earlier modules. So uh, they have, they have uh, you know, tremendous uh, respect for these, uh, for these uh, states. The Western industrial civilization really uh, uh, had a very negative attitude to these kinds of uh, experiences and methods that uh, induce them. They saw them as, as being uh, irrational, as sort of uh, uh, embarrassing leftovers of the of the dark ages, and uh, you know currently we even have uh, uh, laws that would uh, prevent people from creating situations where they can have uh, these kinds of experiences and using the the tools for for them. You know some of the uh, means like psychedelics have been have been uh, outlawed. So we have two types of spiritual experiences. Uh, the first one can be called the um, experience of the immanent divine. This is something that we would have when we have uh, our eyes open and observe the environment. Uh, then would be major, major transformation of uh, the way we perceive it. We would still see people, trees, houses, and so on, but suddenly we would not see it as just a material world we would see it as a work of uh, cosmic creative energy. We would feel the presence uh, of uh, this uh, dimension. Uh, we also would be aware of the fact that uh, under what we perceive as a world of separate objects, there is a unified field so that the, the semblance of, of objects is created by uh, a process of, of uh, individuation, demarcation, uh, boundaries which are really not absolute, which can be uh, transcended in this non-ordinary state. So we see the underlying uh, unity, and there is a sense of luminosity, sacredness of uh, the world. Uh, this dimension is seen as more, uh, or this perspective is seen as more real than what we experience in everyday life. The second, uh, the second uh, category of uh, mystical spiritual experience is called the transcendent divine, where uh, it's mostly with the eyes uh, closed, we had a sense that uh, an entire different dimension emerged into our perceptual field. Suddenly, you know, it seems like we are in heaven or we are in hell or we uh, perceive uh, archetypal beings, uh, great mother goddess, uh, Virgin Mary, Jesus, and so on. Uh, so um, you can say that this uh, other normally invisible dimension unfolds or um, explicates, to use uh, David Bohm's term, out of this uh, invisible dimension into our everyday, everyday uh, perception. Now, if uh, uh, people who are uh, trained as scientists, psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, uh, anthropologists, and so on, when they took uh, LSD or some other psychedelics, 
they had the chance to experience this uh, dimension, the, the, both the uh, immanent divine and the transcendent divine. I have never met a single uh, Western trained scientist who had some powerful spiritual mystical experiences and still continue subscribing to the monistic materialistic worldview. This is completely independent of uh, the intelligence of this person, of uh, the type of education uh, they have on the uh, academic uh, credentials. The experiences this, uh, in this uh, dimension are extremely uh, convincing. We have actually the feeling that what we experience in those days is more real than our everyday reality. It was, has been talked about as uh, awakening, you know, uh, enlighten, enlightening experiences and so on. Uh, the idea that actually in everyday life we uh, live in a, in a strange uh, state uh, similar to a, a dream or similar to hypnosis and then in a, in a spiritual mystical state we actually uh, awaken. We now see uh, a deeper dimension of reality without which the understanding of uh, the universe and ourselves is not possible. So from this perspective, if uh, Western uh, materialistic science does not include uh, in their worldview the, the existence uh, and nature of these uh, inner, uh, normally invisible dimensions, that their perspective is naive, no matter uh, you know, how sophisticated their understanding of the material uh, world is. So this was called uh, Prajna Paramita or, or Transcendental uh, Wisdom in uh, the Eastern uh, traditions. Uh, we had an, or still have an uh, international transpersonal association um, that has had now um, 20 international conferences and they have always a stellar list of presenters. There, there have been people, you know, like um, uh, uh, Ilya Prigozhin, uh, David Bohm, uh, Karl Pribram, uh, you know, people who have tremendous credentials, uh, Fritjof Capra, uh, Rupert Sheldrake, and so on. And they all uh, could subscribe to the transpersonal vision. They all have. Uh, somehow left the, the world of uh, monistic materialistic science. Rupert Sheldrake actually had repeatedly given, given um, lectures on uh, the imperfection of uh, Western science. He was responding um, to the book, which was called uh, God Fallacy by Richard Dawkins, by writing a book, uh, The Science Fallacy, which was uh, um, translated, uh, which was published in uh, uh, the United States as uh, Science Set Free, where he shows the basic fallacies of uh, Western materialistic science. Uh, so in, in these conferences, you know, people were meeting, uh, they were experts from different uh, disciplines. There were psychiatrists, psychologists, uh, anthropologists, there were uh, uh, cosmologists, uh, uh, people who were um, trained, you know, in uh, systems theory, uh, people like uh, Irvin Laszlo, who uh, not only uh, were critical of the monistic materialistic uh, worldview, but they uh, offered really significant, uh, significant uh, alternatives uh, to it. So these, uh, these uh, people, no matter what their sophistication was, when they had the uh, holotropic state of consciousness, they realized that they were sources of valid uh, information about the world and also valid information about the uh, mythological realm, the archetypal realm. So that there was not just the uh, Freudian, uh, individual unconscious, but also the Jungian collective unconscious uh, access to 
you know, really uh, authentic uh, information about uh, other centuries, uh, other countries, and also about the, the mythological world that was going way beyond anything that they uh, learned in the, in the conventional sense. Now, the uh, holotropic experiences also have another dimension, uh, which is a numinosity, sense of sacredness, uh, to the direct perception of the fact that this uh, uh, dimension that uh, is revealed in holotropic states seems to be actually super, uh, um, so it seems to be uh, super ordinated uh, to uh, the um, everyday, everyday perception. And this gives a tremendous authority and uh, persuasiveness. So it's, whether we uh, are uh, spiritual or not uh, really depends on whether we had access to these holotropic experiences that open that whole experiential uh, dimension. Now we can uh, also uh, look at the difference between spirituality and religion. Usually the, the critiques that come from uh, Western materialistic science don't discriminate uh, you know, between uh, some kind of folk uh, beliefs or, or fun fundamentalist uh, interpretation of the sacred uh, scripts and some of the very sophisticated uh, systems like the Eastern uh, spiritual philosophies, Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, Taoism, or, or the Sufi uh, uh, tradition and so on. Uh, so we, we have to dis make a distinction, you know, uh, the uh, uh, dogmas of organized religions uh, would be uh, incompatible with science of any kind, whether it's the uh, naturalistic science or whether it's uh, um, the uh, new paradigm science. But there is nothing unscientific about studying holotropic states, studying mystical, spiritual experience. Uh, what their phenomenology is, uh, what are the means of uh, inducing them, what are the mechanisms in, in inducing them, and uh, also uh, the impact that these uh, experiences have on, on people. So this can be subjected to very rigorous scientific uh, research like any other aspect of the universe. So spirituality is based on a direct uh, experience of the numinous, of the sacred dimension of uh, reality, the, the uh, sacred uh, dimension that we find uh, in our own psyche and that we see, then see in uh, the world in, this, in these experiences. Spirituality is a very private, very personal matter. It's something between the individual and the cosmos. It doesn't require any special place, any special time. It doesn't require a hierarchy of uh, um, appointed uh, officials. Uh, the mystics, uh, they don't need uh, churches, temples. Uh, they uh, discover the, the numinous uh, in their own body and in, in the nature. Now, this is very different from uh, organized uh, religions, uh, which is a, a involved uh, uh, like an um, organized activity that requires a special, special place, that has a hierarchy of uh, uh, appointed uh, officials. And uh, when the mystical experience is, is all embracing, all inclusive, the organized religion would uh, define its own territory, which then would be different from uh, other organized uh, religions. Um, Joseph Campbell had a very interesting perspective. He said, uh, a useful deity should be transparent to the transcendent, which means it should be pointing to uh, the source, but not be mistaken for the source, spiritual source uh, itself. So when we make the, uh, the uh, images uh, uh, opaque, as he says, the deities are opaque, 
then we worship uh, uh, these images, and uh, then we have what uh, Joseph uh, called uh, idolatry, uh, where the mystical uh, tradition they see through these uh, through these archetypal images, and they uh, basically connect with the source out of which everything uh, comes. Now, the organized uh, religion starts from uh, spiritual uh, experiences of the founders and it's then uh, actually maintained by the experiences of the of the followers of the apostles of the early students of the of the prophets so we can now look at some of the um, experiences that uh, uh, the founders of religions had or the the saints the uh, the prophets on the first picture uh, we can see moses in, with the burning uh, bush this is a wonderful picture by Ernst Fuchs, who himself was inspired very much by his psychedelic experiences. And we can also see the, uh, the face of Jesus in a kind of a holographic way, looking uh, through, the, through that uh, landscape. Now the second picture uh, shows the uh, temptation of Jesus by uh, the devil. This was an experience that uh, he had when he was in the desert. Uh, show the next one, please. Um, and the devil was offering, offering Jesus all the kingdoms of the world, or was asking him uh, on this picture to jump from a height and uh, show that he is son of God by being uh, able to do that and not hurting himself. Uh, another picture, part of the, for the the temptation. Now then the, the next picture is uh, the temptation of Saint Anthony. We can see the bearded uh, saint in the right lower picture and then the horrifying figures. He was uh, also in the desert and he was uh, uh, sort of tempted sexually and uh, tempted uh, by wonderful food when he was fasting, and then of course scared by these horrifying images. Uh, the first one was uh, from the Baldung Green. The next one that we see now, the the saint holding the uh, the crucifix uh, against it. This is also temptation of Saint Anthony by Salvador Rosa. Uh, then the next picture when we see the uh, the riders. Uh, this is the picture uh, by Dürer uh, from the vision of St. John on uh, uh, the island Patmos in his uh, cage when he had the vision of the apocalypse. So these are the uh, four uh, riders of the apocalypse. And uh, then the next one is a more elaborate uh, picture uh, that is in color. And now we go uh, to uh, another very, very important uh, document. Uh, this is uh, Mirage Name. Uh, this is the miraculous journey of uh, Mohammed when uh, he um, experienced the vision of Archangel Gabriel, uh, who uh, came on a, on a um, mare with a, with a uh, human head and was taking him on a journey through, through hell, through uh, paradise, and through the seven heavens. So on this first picture, we see uh, Mohammed arriving uh, at the, the gate of hell. Uh, the figure on the right is Prince Mali, who was the guardian, who never talked, was silent, except uh, when Mohammed arrived there and supposedly greeted him. Now, in the next picture, we have uh, the hell, the sinners in hell, not very different from what we find in, in Christian hell. And then again, we see uh, Mohammed on his, uh, on his uh, mount and uh, then Archangel Gabriel. It's a particular difficult uh, uh, punishment in uh, the Islamic hell, which is the uh, tree that, that uh, is poisonous uh, 
fruit and also uh, spikes that uh, hurt the believers. The next picture is uh, Muhammad arriving into paradise when we see the uh, rivers of um, clean water and uh, oil and so on. And he is being uh, welcomed uh, there. And this is the scene that we hear about uh, recently in relation to, to um, the suicidal attempts of uh, the Islamic fundamentalists. This is the paradise that's being uh, offered to them when they uh, kill infidel. And this is a beautiful garden, again, with gorgeous, uh, gorgeous fruit, um, great uh, food available. And these are the uh, black-eyed gurus, uh, are the women who are um, supposedly available, uh, always in a virginal state, that after each uh, sexual encounter, they turn back, back into virgin. And they, uh, the gurus have, uh, Camels, and they have every Friday they have uh, audience with uh, Allah. Now, this uh, the next one is a golden tree beset uh, with jewels, and we can see on the right Archangel Gabriel, on uh, the left uh, uh, Mohammed, and. Uh, this is a wish fulfilling uh, tree. It's one of the uh, things that they saw in one of the heavens. Each of the heaven is related to a particular jewel. And then the next thing, if it seems, uh, that looks, uh, uh, you know, like a, like a fire of uh, gold. Uh, this shows uh, Muhammad bowing to Allah. He, he has an audience uh, with Allah in the seventh heaven. And this was described as, uh, ecstasy approaching annihilation. Now if we go to the next picture, uh, this is from uh, the history of the Buddha when he was meditating under the bow tree and experienced the um, uh, apparition of uh, Kama Mara, the master of the um, world illusion, who was trying to detract him from his spiritual quest. So on this picture there are three three women uh, who are the daughters uh, of Kamamara, very seductive, who are trying to uh, get the Buddha interested in sex instead of spirituality. Uh, the next one shows the army of uh, Kamamara. When he didn't succeed with the sexual seduction, he now wanted to scare Buddha, uh, instill anxiety in him by, you know, bringing this army also with hurricane and volcanic explosions and so on. Uh, the next picture is the same, but it's, it's uh, in the form of a sculpture when you can see uh, the Buddha sitting in meditation and you can see the, the three sisters on the left side and then Kamamara's army around him. And the next picture gives us both, gives us uh, the three uh, sisters in front of uh, the Buddha, and then in the background, this is the, the army that's trying to scare uh, Buddha. And uh, the last uh, picture of the series is uh, the experience of what was called Paranirvana. It's what's the, the death of the Buddha, and you can see all nature that is uh, that is mourning uh, the death of this very special being. Uh, so thank you. We can just uh, leave the uh, leave the pictures. These experiences are seen by Western science, by psychiatrists, as being uh, uh, manifestations of a mental disease of uh, psychosis. So we have a number of uh, books, uh, articles that describe what would be the best diagnosis for uh, these kinds of uh, experiences in the individuals who had them. So for example, 
the experiences of uh, Ramakrishna, uh, where it's uh, labeled as uh, psychotic, as schizo schizophrenic. The experience of uh, Saint Teresa were called uh, hysterical uh, psychosis. Uh, the experiences of uh, Saint John uh, of the Cross uh, were labeled as, as uh, uh, hereditary uh, degeneration. Uh, the visions of Muhammad that really inspired uh, Islam um, were attributed to a um, um, seizure condition that Mohammed had, uh, a type of uh, epilepsy. So they were seen as epileptic visions. And uh, there's a, even a paper by uh, Franz Alexander that sees uh, Buddhist meditation as uh, a pathological phenomenon. Uh, the, the paper is called um, Buddhist Meditation as Artificial uh, Catatonia. So we have a very interesting uh, perspective of uh, Western science on the history of religion. It, uh, the great religions were inspired by schizophrenics or uh, epileptics. How would it be possible that you know millions or billions of uh, people, relatively normal, would get so uh, impressed by these experiences, so inspired? that many of them would give up their everyday life to pursue uh, the spirituality or the, the life that was somehow indicated by these systems. How come that the experiences of schizophrenics, about 1% of the world population, you know, post-culturally, is uh, seen as schizophrenic. So experiences of 1% of uh, the population would uh, inspire people to build uh, incredible temples, cathedrals, synagogues, you know, Hindu temples, uh, Gothic cathedrals, would inspire amazing uh, music, amazing uh, art. So uh, it's very clear that this is a misunderstanding uh, of what religion, what spirituality is about, which we find in Western uh, psychiatry. Don't really know uh, the uh, transpersonal domain and the, and the perinatal domain of the, of the unconscious that would give a, a different kind of explanation that uh, the experiences that these people had were manifestations from the Gothic, from the um, Jungian uh, collective unconscious so that uh, they're not the product of a pathological process but they are expressions of uh, the, the psyche per se, but the psyche which has infinitely larger dimensions than we hear uh, about in, uh, in psychiatry. We have seen uh, that uh, the great religions were inspired by what we would call now transpersonal experiences or you know, holotropic states of consciousness of the founders, the, the prophets and the, and, uh, the saints. They inspired the great religions, but when the uh, religions became organized, then uh, very typically they uh, lost the connection to the spiritual source and they became uh, to a great extent a secular uh, institution that was uh, exploiting the spiritual needs of people, but not really satisfying them. They became much more interested in uh, money, in uh, uh, possessions, in uh, control uh, of people, in uh, politics. Uh, so they, uh, they were not really uh, following somehow the inspiration that came from these, from these mystical experiences. Uh, Brother David uh, talks about it in, in a very, very interesting uh, simile. He says the, the mystical experience is uh, exciting, it's uh, dynamic, it's like a, like a magma, like a volcanic uh, explosion. Uh, when we have that experience, uh, we feel very, very uh, impressed and we want to understand it. We think about it and might put it into some kind of a conceptual 
framework directly related to that experience. And we have a doctrine. Uh, we um, have really a great memory of this uh, experience and we want to uh, celebrate it. We want to commemorate it. And so we create a ritual, again, directly related to this mystical experience. And uh, in the mystical uh, experience, we would get a sense for the uh, cosmic, uh, ethical, or moral order. And uh, we discover our uh, um, connection with nature. We uh, discover the um, underlying unity of everything, the fact how that we are connected very deeply uh, with our people, with uh, um, you know, our neighbors, with humanity, and so on. And so it uh, results in a certain kind of a uh, behavior that's a direct experience, a direct expression of that mystical experience. We would treat uh, other people as we would treat ourselves. We treat nature with respect because we saw how important it was. Now then, uh, Brother David says, then for a variety of reasons, the... Um, religions uh, lose the connection with the spiritual source and become organized. And then uh, the uh, rules are very different. Then um, we um, create a ritual, but the ritual does not have the connection or we don't experience the connection to the original experience. So it becomes a kind of empty uh, ritualism. Uh, since we uh, don't have the direct experience, uh, the, something that was a doctrine directly reflecting the experience becomes a dogma that is just presenting people to believe without having any kind of experiential founding, any kind of experiential um, support for that. And the, uh, what was the, the cosmic uh, ethical order and the uh, behavior that was resulting from it uh, becomes uh, commandments, uh, becomes uh, rules, becomes uh, moralism, where people are asked to do something without really having a deeper uh, cellular understanding why they are doing it. And it's imposed on them, usually with threats. If you don't do this, these are the, these are the kinds of things that happen. And they would be threatened by uh, secular law, but also by some punishment that would come uh, in, the, in the beyond. And this morality would be very, very differ different from that, from that natural uh, uh, ethical attitude to other people and to, to nature that comes from the mystical experience and it's, uh, it's kind of fomented uh, by it. Uh, so I'll go back to, that, uh, to the question of, um, of uh, spirituality and religion and science essentially properly understood uh, there should not be any conflict between uh, spirituality and science we need both we need science uh, to get information um, that helps us to orient ourselves in the material world and we also need spirituality uh, to give us the meaning uh, in life Kenny Wilber, in his book, uh, A Sociable God, expressed it in a very similar, very interesting way. He said, if there seems to be conflict between uh, religion and uh, science, it's very likely bogus religion and bogus science. It means that uh, they, those two systems don't understand each other, but they very likely are not even the best example of their own kind. So there is a conflict between uh, you know, organ and the dogmas of organized religion and any kind of science, whether it's uh, uh, monistic materialistic science, uh, um, mechanistic science, or uh, some of the version of the new, new paradigm science. But there's no conflict between what we find and uh, the study of, of uh, spirituality, mystical experiences, and, and uh, you know, properly understood uh, science. Now we have one example in history when this actually uh, 
happened, where it was not a problem, where, where science and spirituality really uh, fused together, were presented as one organic uh, system. And uh, that was Tantra. Tantra uh, is a, a branch of uh, three different religions. There's a Hindu Tantra, there's a Buddhist Tantra, and there is a uh, Jain uh, Tantra. And there are sort of unorthodox, uh, in a sense, uh, if you want, uh, uh, sacrilegious, uh, ch challenging uh, um, perspective of those uh, religions that violate many of the, of the rules that are uh, imposed on people by the organized religions. But, uh, you know, Tantra is an extremely complex uh, system that uh, had very advanced science that had a very deep psycho-spiritual theory and that also uh, a ritual that provided for people direct experience to the holotropic uh, dimensions of uh, reality. Uh, the beginnings of Tantra are usually seen in actually in uh, uh, the great civilizations uh, uh, around the Indus uh, Valley, the uh, like Mohenjo Daro, Arapa, and so on, where we find um, images of uh, uh, yogis, but at the same time the, the cult of the great uh, great mother goddess. Then uh, the first uh, written texts. Uh, of uh, Tantra are around uh, the birth of uh, Jesus, uh, although there were sort of uh, precedents you, you find in, uh, in the uh, Mahabharata Ramayana, in the Puranas, in some of the, some of the uh, Indian ancient uh, scriptures. And then uh, in the 18th century, this was like a flourishing of, uh, of Tantra. We have a lot of beautiful Tantric art. So we'll now go to the to the second part of the uh, pictures, if I can if I can see them. And uh, so the first uh, uh, table is uh, showing what tantric scientists uh, accomplished. They had uh, amazing uh, uh, physics and uh, astronomy. For example, they had the age of the universe uh, computed in, in billions of years, very similar to uh, what you find in uh, modern cosmology. You believe that it's about 13.8 uh, billion of years. Now this is in great contrast with what came up in uh, the Western world, where around the, the time of Darwin, there was a still general belief that uh, the universe was created uh, 6,000 years on, on seven consecutive days. And the, the way this uh, uh, came up was that somebody counted the lives of the people described in the Bible. This lived 900 years, this lived 600 years, and they came up with the, with the uh, number 6,000. And it's really interesting that even today, there are a lot of people in the United States that believe it. And we had actually American President George Bush who demanded that this kind of a, what he called theory, creationist theory, uh, would be taught uh, in schools and given the same amount of time as the, uh, you know, the scientific evolutionary theory. So Tantra had it. The universe was billions of years uh, uh, old. They had... Uh, the understanding that we have a heliocentric system. They knew that the planets were uh, round. They had very uh, advanced astronomy. For example, in uh, Delhi and in uh, Jaipur, there is something called Jantar Mantar, which is a very complex uh, architectural structure, which has sort of uh, round walls and, and square walls and uh, amphitheaters and so on. And uh, depending on where the shadows fall on these walls, you can uh, cast an instant uh, horoscope. Now, um, they also had a very advanced uh, theory of uh, vibration. You know, both the 
physical vibration in the world and uh, the one that is uh, uh, sort of related to the to the invisible uh, dimensions of, of the universe so for them the universe was a vibratory uh, system it was created by the by a sound ohm vibratory vibratory uh, process they had uh, very advanced uh, mathematics um, and they actually are the ones who uh, discovered the decimal system and uh, and uh, zero they had quite advanced uh, chemistry now all these uh, all these um, um, scientific achievements were paralleled by um, discoveries of, of uh, the parallel esoteric systems so they had advanced astronomy but also astrology as an integral part of this uh, worldview they had um, chemistry but they also had uh, alchemy uh, it was also palmistry was a, an integral uh, part uh, of this they had uh, this advanced psycho spiritual system where um, uh, you know our psyche uh, could perceive not just the material world but also get in touch with this uh, uh, dimension normally invisible dimension which was uh, necessary you know for the existence of the universe out of out of uh, this dimension actually the universe emerged in a similar way in which uh, David Bohm talks about the implicate and the explicate explicate order you have to have no more than just what you see in the material world to really understand what this is uh, about and they have you know they had a very advanced ritual using uh, various meditation practices spiritual practices but also uh, a mixture of uh, ayurvedic herbs that combined uh, uh, aphrodisiacs and uh, plants with psychedelic uh, properties as we heard from uh, Ajit Mukherjee who was a, who was a tantric, uh, tantric uh, scholar so this was then used in uh, the left-handed tantra or uh, Vama Marga when uh, the different elements uh, uh, were actually enacted uh, in the material world for example the confrontation with death was happening in uh, cemeteries meditating in the cemeteries and the burning god really getting in touch with death and and uh, it also involved uh, uh, pancha makara which is this the, the maituna the sacred sexual uh, context uh, whereas on the uh, the right hand uh, tantra the dakshina marga this was all enacted in the form of uh, meditation there was not involvement of the material material world so this were very very sophisticated uh, methods of actually uh, achieving the direct experiential access to this normally invisible uh, dimension uh, the next picture please now tantra has the, the concept of cross points uh, which were certain aspects of material world that uh, were seen as a kind of a gateways into the invisible dimension uh, sort of doing something in those um, cross point areas provided the access to the luminous dimensions of uh, reality so we see that some of the cross, cross points were related to uh, the human body you could um, take certain yogic postures asana uh, you could uh, use your breath breath was extremely important cross point and uh, i talked about the fact that in uh, um, ancient cultures and uh, native cultures that the breath was seen as something very special something that connects the external world air our body the lungs uh, our psyche it creates psychological experiences and also uh, can reach uh, the spiritual the spiritual dimension so the importance of breath as a cross point was very uh, emphasized in uh, tantra 
vocal cords, sounds, you know, extremely, extremely important uh, cross point. Uh, working with uh, chakras and the nadis, which is the nadis are the spiritual conduits in the, in the subtle body, and uh, uh, the chakras uh, are in the spiritual centers in the place where the two major conduits uh, of the uh, of, uh, subtle body nadis are uh, crossing. Of course, the sexual organs were seen as, a, as an important cross point, which was then utilized in the in the left hand uh, tantric uh, ritual. Then uh, visual art is very, very important in Tantra. It's very, very advanced, very sophisticated. That has two aspects. Uh, one is uh, just using uh, completely abstract paintings. And in a, in a minute, I will show the, the uh, symbolic uh, alphabet of, uh, of Tantra. So you could express very, very complicated uh, spiritual concepts by using uh, just uh, geometrical patterns, this triangle with the circle, the, the line, and so on. But uh, Tantra also has very uh, elaborate uh, um, visual, visual art, both uh, sort of mythological, you know, archetypal images, uh, uh, and then a combination of these abstract images and, uh, and archetypal images as we find it in the mandala. So the uh, representation uh, of spiritual concepts, which is uh, only geometrical, it's called yantra, and this combination of uh, geometry and mythology, if you want, the iconography is, is uh, mandala. Then, of course, sound is an extremely important cross point in uh, in uh, Tantra, uh, there are something that's called seed syllables. If you chant them, you can have certain uh, spiritual uh, impact. Uh, there are mantras. And then, of course, there is music, both chanting and, and then instrumental, instrumental music. So we'll, we'll move to the next one which is the, the tantric abstract symbolism and what these different uh, geometrical elements mean. So we have a point, which is extremely important. This is Mahabindu in Tantra. This is uh, uh, the beginning of creation and the end of the spiritual journey. Uh, it's a very interesting parallel in cosmology with what the uh, physicists call singularity. The whole universe came from a, a dimensionless point, which is called uh, singularity. And during the uh, Big Bang, out of it came time and space and all the matter that uh, created the universe. Now, you know, billions of galaxies, as I, as I said. So uh, the Mahabindu experienced the, the source of creation, the singularity out of which creation came. And then it went into the into the process of, of uh, divisions and, and separations and so on until we end up where we are now. And then, if we are on a spiritual journey, according to Tantra, we are we are undoing creation, very much like uh, the alchemists talked about it. Uh, the alchemical process is uh, uh, pro, uh, um, opus contra na uh, naturam, uh, work against nature which we are undoing the creation, we are dissolving the boundaries until at the end, we end up with only the polar polarities and then the polarities fuse and we return into the, uh, into the Mahabindu. So Mahabindu is the beginning of the creation uh, of the universe, but also experientially is the end of our spiritual journey when we transcend all uh, polarities and uh, duality. Then uh, uh, we have a line, which means some kind of a development, growth. Uh, we have a circle, which represents the uh, transcendental uh, dimension, also the motion of, uh, of uh, planets. Uh, I talked about it in connection with Jung. Jung 
call the circle as you present the presentation of the uh, transcendental realm and the square as in uh, Tantra he saw as uh, earth as this grounding of the experience. Uh, then the spiral, spiral can represent the ascending uh, or descending uh, Kundalini depending which direction, direction uh, the spiral goes. And then we can uh, look at the next picture where we have the, the pentacle, which doesn't uh, mean the same as in uh, you know, black magic, uh, but it represents five elements, uh, uh, you know, uh, water, water, earth, uh, fire, air, and, uh, and akasha. Then we have uh, an important uh, symbol of triangle, which can uh, represent the three worlds or three gunas, which are three aspects of, uh, of uh, the female energy, tamas, rajas, and sattva. Then we can uh, combine these triangles in, in, the, in such a way that they intersect. The uh, down-pointing triangle means uh, yoni, means the, the, the feminine symbol, the one that points up is uh, uh, a masculine principle, if you put them together into six pointed star, you get creation, which is something that you find represented in the uh, fourth chakra when the masculine and feminine uh, come together in, in the creative process. And then, if you uh, posi uh, position the triangles in such a way that they touch with the points, then it's the symbol for Damaru, which is the the drum of the of Shiva in his destructive uh, aspect. And uh, then you find also in uh, uh, the yantras and in uh, the mandalas, you find uh, a lotus, a stylized lotus blossom, and then sometimes a kind of meander uh, type uh, uh, forms that are called gates. So we can now look at some of the, some of uh, the yantras and the and the, also the iconographic art in uh, Tantra. So before we do that again, I would like to combine this is a system that combined uh, very sophisticated advanced science, scientific worldview for its time uh, and it involved it with a psycho-spiritual system that gave both the cartography of uh, the psyche, but also uh, the, the means, uh, the practical means, how you can, how you can uh, connect with the spiritual, uh, spiritual uh, dimension. And Tantra, again, is a system that has uh, the scientific uh, disciplines like astronomy uh, and alchemy, but the parallel uh, in the esoteric systems, uh, astronomy, astrology, and uh, chemistry, alchemy. We can think about Newton, who his uh, uh, biographer Keynes described as not only the first great scientist, but the last a great magician uh, who uh, was able to reconcile easily what he brought uh, to the scientific world with his other deep interests, which were uh, astrology and uh, alchemy. So let's go to uh, the first uh, yantra. So this is what uh, yantras look like. Uh, Tantra has over 900 of these. They represent different deities and also different aspects of deities or different uh, uh, processes. So you can see the triangles uh, in, the, in the middle. We can see a, a wreath of uh, stylized lotus uh, blossoms and we can see uh, you know, the circle and the square, the quadrature of the, of, uh, the circle. And the T shapes, those are the gates that I was talking about. This is just another, you know, one of these uh, 900 uh, yantras. Now, this is what the, what the really sophisticated, beautiful iconography of uh, Tantra is like. Uh, the protagonists in uh, the process of creation in Tantra are only two, is the uh, Shiva and uh, Mahashakti. 
Kali, Mahakali. And you can see Shiva, who is uh, represented as a corpse. The, uh, unlike in the West, uh, the masculine element in Tantra is seen as the passive one. And we can see uh, Kali sitting uh, on uh, Shiva. This is the representation of the, mas of the feminine energy, which is seen as, the, as uh, the principle that actually is responsible for creation. Um, the masculine uh, element um, brings the, uh, the logos, the, the idea for creation, but the actual um, creation is then a completely a feminine affair. This is more accurate representation than uh, the one that we have, where we see the masculine as active and the, the uh, feminine as passive. If we look at procreation, uh, the male represents uh, the, the information, the, the sperm is uh, just the genetic information and the entire creation it happens in the, of the, of the fetus, of the a new life happens in the female body. We also see here um, Ganges that coming out of uh, Shiva's head. Another beautiful creation where we see Shakti, Kali, Mahakali, cutting off her own head and feeding herself and then uh, also uh, her uh, devotees. Uh, the uh, left side is uh, the masculine side here. The Nandi bull is a symbol of Shiva and the right one is the feminine side. Um, tiger is the symbol of uh, Kali. And then we have to see uh, the foxes and, and wolf, those are seen on the burning god. So they're also seen very frequently in tantric images together with crows and so on. And these two women, uh, these two figures, the woman and uh, uh, the uh, other figure, those are uh, the forces of creation. The ne uh, next picture is very, very interesting. Uh, this is a hermaphroditic uh, figure that puts together uh, Shiva and uh, Shakti. Shiva is holding the trident, which is a symbol, and uh, uh, Kali is uh, uh, dressed in red. So this is a this is a situation where the masculine and the, the feminine are not completely separated. So when I talked about the Bindu as a source of creation, the first uh, expression of the Bindu is uh, polarity. And one of the polarities, important polarities, of course, is male, female. So there is an experience where um, when we are on a spiritual journey, when we reached uh, in the process of dissolving the, the polarities and the boundaries, we reach uh, a situation where the masculine and the feminine are not completely separated. And then the next step is that there is a fusion and you have the unity, basically the bindu, the source out of which creation, uh, creation came. So this, this would be both something that is the first step in cosmogony, in the creation of the universe, and also the last stop uh, in the, or the last stage in the process of spiritual quest just before we completely transcend the, the boundaries. And now we can see here how uh, the same kind of concepts can be expressed in Tantra, both iconographically or just in a completely geometrical way. So these are the, the Maha Shaktis, the different aspects of Kali in a uh, iconographic form. And this is how you can uh, represent it by the corresponding uh, yantras. So, People who understand this kind of symbolism uh, recognize in, uh, from the from the yantras to which deities uh, uh, these yantras belong. And if you meditate on this kind of uh, picture, you are supposed to get access to uh, the uh, archetype of that particular deity. So this is how you can represent uh, uh, Krishna and Radha again. Uh, 
either as a sculpture or as a yantra. Now, uh, uh, then the next one is a very complex yantra, which is called actually Sri Yantra. We see it here in the form of a drawing. Uh, this is a nine triangles, some of them going uh, up, some of them going down. The, in, the different uh, interactions between the feminine and, the, and uh, the masculine, which is seen uh, something that happens on different planes of, uh, of uh, creation. And then uh, you can see this whole thing is, uh, is framed by the, by the gates. This is the most sacred, sacred yantra that depending which uh, plane you access here, you can sort of take different parts of this uh, whole diagram and uh, mark it, let's say it's red or blue, and it would uh, represent different stages of creation and different stages of, uh, of the spiritual journey. So you start from the Bindu where you can just accentuate the, uh, the first, uh, stage of creation, which is the singularity, and then the next one would be the polarity, where you would mark some other fields in the middle, and then towards the end, uh, we would end up with the totality of, of creation. And the last uh, picture then is the Sri Yantra in colors. Very, very beautiful, very complex, that uh, basically uh, sums up the, the whole uh, iconography that you find in Tantra. So in a sense, Tantra is our uh, ideal, our model of what we would like to achieve in uh, transpersonal psychology when uh, you bring together the best of spirituality, and the best of uh, science, in this case, the emerging paradigm science, and integrate them into uh, a complex worldview where you have no real uh, conflict between, between uh, spirituality and uh, science. So uh, I think I have used my time, so we'll end here and uh, we'll see each other uh, or encounter next uh, Tuesday. Thank you very much.